Okay. So yeah, hello everybody. We were just uh, waiting on folks to finish the quiz and end the Zoom meeting and get into another one for the lecture. Um, so here we go. We will start a new topic today. We only have five more topics left. So we're getting the end of the semester, which is, um, you know, it went by too fast, I think. Okay, so today we're going to talk about vitamin analysis. Um, let's see. Okay, let's start with what do you know about vitamins? How do you define them? You can type, you can unmute yourself, whatever you want. Nobody's gonna define vitamins. I know I'm, some of you is minoring in nutrition. Okay, micronutrients that help facilitate healthy functioning. That's good. So they're essential nutrients. Essential, exactly. Thank you, Take Vero. So they are a group of organic compounds. They are essential. We can't synthesize them in synthesize them in our body. So we need to get them from an outside source and they're needed in a very small amount. So yes, that's the definition of vitamin. Good. And we need them for biological functions. Why is it important to analyze vitamins. You can unmute, you can type. Isn't the vitamin C degradation is a common concern, right? Processing effects. Yes, degradation of vitamins during processing and vitamin C is one big one uh, that is impacted by thermal processing. Labeling, definitely. Uh, what what vitamins we find on the label? Quality supplementation, fortification, exactly. So yes, it's a combination. The old uh, the old label, which is still I think in place, it's A and C. But the new label that was approved in 2016, it says only vitamin D. Um, so it really depended on, in back in the day when um, nutrition labeling regulations were put in place, vitamin A and C were among the main vitamins where we have deficiencies. But due to fortifications and enrichment uh, effort, uh, this is no longer an issue. What remains an issue now is vitamin D deficiency. So that then that became an important uh, vitamin to be put on the label. Um, so here's the definition of a vitamin. We just uh, specified it, but it is an organic compound required as a nutrient in very small amount. And it's called a vitamin because we cannot synthesize it in sufficient quantities in our bodies. So why is it important? Assess diet adequacy. If we have enough, a sufficient amount of vitamins in our diet, um, nutrition labeling for those specific components. But sometimes if you have a product or a supplement, uh, they have, you have the expanded nutrition label and they do list um, most of the vitamins and minerals as well. And to determine the effect of processing, which is very important for uh, vitamins that are um, susceptible to thermal degradation, to oxidation, to light degradation. And here are the vitamin A and C in the old one. And then you do have sometimes expanded labels that shows most of the important vitamins. And then this is the new one that only shows vitamin D. 
So here's just a table that is basically a FYI table. It gives you the year of discovery of the different vitamins and the main sources for these vitamins and the lettered name as well as the common name. So vitamin A or retinol, vitamin B or thiamine, vitamin B2 or riboflavin, B3, niacin, and so on. So you have the water soluble vitamins category, which is vitamin C and all of the other vitamins, vitamin Bs. And then you have the fat soluble, which, is, which are the ADEK, A-D-E-K vitamins. So this is kind of an FYI table for you, not necessarily to study and know. It will be good to know. So these are the different vitamins. So they, they don't belong to one category uh, of organic compounds. Some, for example, have an amino acid associated with it, like the glutamate. Um, so this vitamin nine, which is folic acid or folate, they have glutamate associated with it. Um, vitamin A, which comes, which is retinol, which comes from beta carotene. Um, so it has a unique structure and some have nitrogen components in them. Some don't have nitrogen in it, like ascorbic acid, for example. So some have phenolic structures, some don't. So, and they vary in size and molecular weight. So they are different, very different. They vary in solubility as well and potential of oxidation. So is there, is it possible to analyze all vitamins following one technique? Can we use one technique to get total vitamin content potentially? No, we cannot. They're very different. So there's not one method that will give us total vitamins or total soluble vitamins or total fat soluble vitamins. There's no such thing. So there is a method that is unique for each vitamin. There is each vitamin requires a unique ex, um, extraction procedure from the food matrix and also a unique testing uh, methodology. Okay, so we cannot get total vitamins like we get total proteins or total acids or total carbohydrates. There's no such thing. So there are different analytical methods and we'll go over some examples together today. So we have bioassays. That means you need animals or humans to, to test, uh, to determine amounts um, or microbial assays, which is based on microbial growth. Uh, where the microbe needs a certain vitamin to grow. So you can monitor growth based on, and relate that to concentration. And of course, there are the chemical assays, which could be potentially titration, could be microscopy, uh, fluorescence, or could be um, based on chromatography and detection based on UV detection or fluorescence detection. So we'll talk about, we'll give examples about, uh, on all of these essays. And uh, these, uh, there is a table in your textbook, which is a very informative table. Um, that it's table 21, 20, number one. And it summarizes different official methods of analysis for these vitamins, for all the vitamins and in different food matrices. So it is a very informative table in case in the future you work in a laboratory and you need an official method of analysis for let's say uh, vitamin D in infant food. Then there you go that you have that reference too. One thing I want you um, to make sure you know is that uh, the impact of extraction methodology on this, the sensitivity of the vitamins and the accuracy of your results. So a lot of these vitamins are subject to oxidation. For example, for example, vitamin E, E, and C are very subject to oxidation. Uh, some, some are sensitive to pH, alkaline pH, for example. Vitamin C is 
uh, most degradable under alkaline pH. So we extract it in acid and make sure we do all the analysis in acidic pH. Um, some are sensitive to light. Riboflavin, for example, is very sensitive to UV light. So if you're measuring the quantity of riboflavin vitamin, you kind of work in a lab with subdued um, light so that you don't get um, degradation of riboflavin in the sample that you're trying to analyze. So all of these different uh, vitamins, we have to be very cautious when we extract them and analyze them so that they don't get degraded along the way and we have erroneous results. So extraction methods. So depending on the matrix that you have, these vitamins, you need to release them from their interaction, whether they're interacting with fat, let's say the lipid uh, soluble or fat soluble vitamins, you extract them in an organic um, solvent, but then there's fat there too. So you want to get rid of that fat, you supplementify the fat to solubilize it out and then extract with organic solvent again your vitamin. So uh, in terms of um, water soluble vitamins, oftentimes you autoclave. So that means you use heat and acid most of the time to extract that vitamin from the matrix. Sometimes you need to use enzymes to release the vitamins from interaction with protein or carbohydrate. So you need to use these enzymes to release the vitamin and then be able to analyze it. So like I said, we do have uh, precautions that we have to take during sample preparation because of the potential of degradation. For example, those vitamins that are subject to oxidation, oftentimes you add an antioxidant. A reducing agents such as beta ethanol is sometimes added to prevent oxidation while you're preparing a sample and while you're running. Um, you often, when you prepare your sample, you have to hold it for a little bit until you prepare the agents or until you have all samples prepared. So it's best to flush with nitrogen so that you don't have oxygen uh, available to the sample. So you flush your uh, container with nitrogen close it really well so the sample is secure and not uh, you don't have reactive oxygen there that to induce oxidation. Sometimes you have to add uh, chelating agents. Um, so iron, for example, um, is um, a catalyst for oxidation. So one time we had a capstone group uh, that wanted to determine measure vitamin C in a product because they were fortifying with vitamin C, but at the same time, they were fortifying with iron. And they wanted to determine the impact of specific processing on their vitamin C. And they tried to measure vitamin C and they couldn't find any, any vitamin C or very little amount. So they they came and they were asking, well, we put vitamin C and we're not able to measure. And I asked, what, what's the composition? And they listed and finally they said, and yeah, we also are adding iron uh, to for fortification. And then there I asked if you put ADTA and they didn't. So once they put ADTA, it helped to chelate the iron and then they were able to um, successfully measure vitamin. So it's very important to know what's your matrix and what, what interfering substances are there that you need to take care of. Um, so pH is important because, for example, oxidation is, again, uh, enhanced during alkaline conditions. So we need to low, make sure that the pH is low when, for example, extracting vitamin C. So we extract it in an acidic condition to prevent its oxidation. Subdued light, like vitamin A and riboflavin, both are sensitive to uh, ultralight, ultraviolet. And then heat. Um, this example I always give, and because we used to have a lab on vitamin C determination, and now we don't anymore. Um, so with that lab, we used to get orange juice that is fresh. 
orange juice that is pasteurized and is from the fridge, refrigerated. And then we used to get frozen uh, orange juice to determine vitamin C content. So one time we forgot to um, thaw the frozen orange juice concentrate before lab. So we wanted to rush and get it done. One of the TAs thought, okay, we'll put it under hot water. So they put the can in hot water and then it thawed in time for the lab, but then we got much reduced vitamin C because of course it got degraded with the hot water. So it's very important to um, make sure you don't degrade your vitamins when you are analyzing for vitamins uh, and you need accurate results, especially if you wanna determine if the, if the label is accurate. So you make sure you want to process so that you don't, it doesn't appear like you are, you have mislabeled. Okay, so this is an example of bioassay. For the longest time, vitamin D was only assessed in a bioassay. And then um, more methods were developed and now there, there's an HPLC method for vitamin D. Uh, in many dif in different food matrices in infant formulas, as well in other food products. But the original assay was a bioassay. So it was based on using rats in the assay that would be sacrificed at the end. So uh, that means you would have to sacrifice the animal and then get the bones to determine degree of calcification. So we call that test the lion test. That means um, basically with that, what they do is they feed the rats a diet with a deployed of vitamin D. So that means they don't have any vitamin D in their diet for a certain period of time. And then they start feeding them vitamin D in different concentrations, known concentrations, and that's how they build their standard curve. So a group of animal get X, amount, another group get Y, another group gets Z amount, and another group gets the unknown amount in a food product. That's what we wanted to test. And uh, after the end of feeding time, the, the animals get sacrificed, and then they look at uh, calcification in their bones, a specific bone in their body. So that's how they, they plot the standard curve every concentration of the known standard that they've been getting um, versus the uh, classification amount. That would be their standard curve. Microbiological assays are common, they're still used, and they are used mostly for folate as well as time determination. So this is the example for folate. So folate is extracted uh, with Heat. And after the extraction, uh, folate is basically a polymer where you have multiple glutamate uh, attached to it. And also it, is, it interacts a lot with the um, proteins and carbohydrate in, in the system. So it, you have to digest the protein and digest the starch so that this um, folate is released. And also there is a conjugase enzyme that would break down the multiple glutamate uh, units that are associated with that vitamin. After you, you do that, then you have your folic acid in, in a form that can be um, utilized by bacteria, lactobacillus raminosis. So this is the bacteria that would be grown in a media in the presence of different amounts of uh, folate, and then also in another media with the unknown amount of folate coming from that extract from the food. And you can either measure turbidity after a certain amount of time, which is an indication of growth. You can measure transmittance at 550 nanometer. You can also measure production of acid or change in weight or respiration. So chemical methods, these are basically based on chromatographic um, separation. 
So these are common for vitamins A, E, and vitamin D. So these are lipid soluble vitamins. So again, you start with the solvent extraction um, using the flux. So you, like we did in the lab, just to extract using succid, for example. So you extract the lipid component and after that, you saponify. So you get rid of the, uh, you solubilize fatty acids, they become fatty acid salts. You be, they become soluble in, in aqueous, and then you would extract again with organic solvent. And then your vitamins will be in the organic solvent to have that extract, and then you use chromatography. Uh, normal phase is very common, and sometimes you use UV detection, sometimes fluorescence, depending on the enzyme, the vitamin. These are recap questions. It seems like last year I had to stop here. Uh, so it's good review questions for you guys when you're studying. This is the method that we used to do in the lab to determine vitamin C in three different uh, orange juices. Fresh orange juice, like I said, uh, pasteurized refrigerated orange juice and the uh, frozen concentrate. So it, it, it's a very common method that we use for fruit and fruit products. And it is the 2,6-dichloroendophenol method. So basically it is a dye. So the dichloroendophenol is a dye that gets um, reduced by ascorbic acid. So the ascorbic acid reduces the dye and the dye oxidizes the ascorbic acid. That's how it works. So when you hydrate, the dye has a very dark purple, purplish blue color, and you have your juice, and uh, you don't need an indicator. Your dye is the indicator. So you titrate, and every drop that goes in, the ascorbic acid reduces it. So it goes from a purple to colorless. So you keep titrating until all uh, ascorbic acid is reduced, all of the amount is gone, reduced. So the next drop, there's no more L-ascorbic acid in the reducing form, and therefore you get a light pink, and that's the end of your titration, and you would calculate the amount of vitamin C by titrating a standard, and standard amount of vitamin C, then you would uh, calculate the amount of C, the vitamin C in your sample. So here is, um, oh, before I go to the next slide, what do we do if the sample is colored? So if you have a colored juice, you won't be able to see the color uh, change or the, the color of the dye matches or is obstructed by the color of the sample. In this case, we do spectrophotometric and, uh, determination. So you would do measurement at specific wavelengths so that you can uh, look at a specific color absorbance from the dye. So here's the, the action. So basically, in nature, you have L-ascorbic acid. So it reduces the dye. So the dye oxidizes ascorbic acid and ascorbic acid in turn reduces the dye. So you end up with a reduced dye that is colorless and the oxidized form of ascorbic acid. So in nature, you have L-ascorbic acid and it does over time during storage, it can oxidize to L-dehydroascorbic acid. L-dehydroascorbic acid is not completely lost in terms of it does have biological value still. Uh, however, it's, if it's exposed to more oxygen under some heat and light and specific pH, it can continue its oxidation and then get degraded. But L-dehydroascorbic acid is still biologically available. So if you have L-ascorbic acid and L-dehydroascorbic acid in the juice, we need to measure both because both are biologically available. So if I have a sample 
And oftentimes that happens if we get an orange juice sample from a refrigerator in the market and the label says a certain amount of vitamin C and we're trying to measure that vitamin C amount and we see less than the label. That's because we do have potentially aldehyde or ascorbic acid there. So what do we do if we wanna make sure we're measuring both forms, L-ascorbic and aldehyde or ascorbic acid? What do we do to our, for our method to work for both? Any ideas? So ascorbic acid, L-ascorbic acid and aldehyde. Aldehyde ascorbic acid is the, is the oxidized form. No idea, nobody's gonna guess. So oxidize, can you unoxidize it? Yes, we could reduce the sample, Sam. So we basically run the sample before without any reducing agent. And then we run the sample with the reducing agent. So we can get the difference. So the difference would be the amount of aldehyde ascorbic acid. And if we run it from the beginning with the reducing agent, then we're getting total amount of vitamin C, the L ascorbic acid and aldehyde ascorbic acid. So this way we can get a match if we get um, orange juice that just been sitting there or has been mildly processed, pasteurized, some of the ascorbic acids converted to aldehyde ascorbic acid. Also, uh, because you haven't, you didn't do the lab. Uh, another thing we notice sometimes when we run the assay and we get sometimes more vitamin C than the label declared. Uh, do you know why would that be? So let's say the label declares, I don't know, 20 milligrams and we get 25 milligrams per serving. Do you know why? Any ideas? Labeling standards. Well, labeling standard, we wanna make sure that we have at least, especially if it's fortified, we'll make sure at least we have 100% uh, if it is added. Yes, exactly. They add extra to account for loss during storage. That's a good answer, Coleman. Yes, that's exactly what it is because vitamin C is very degradable and over storage and you know, oxidized, not just the, uh, the hydroascorbic acid, it's gonna go continue its oxidation till degradation. So you, they wanna make sure that you have the same, the amount on the label throughout the storage and the shelf life of orange. Good. All right, another method that is commonly used for different types of food and matrices is the, uh, the microfluorometric uh, method. So here, what they do after they extract the vitamin C in acidic condition, they extract it from the food product. And they actually, in this case, they oxidize all of ascorbic acid into aldehydroascorbic acid. So they add an oxidizing agent to change it to aldehydroascorbic acid, which reacts with, um, O-phenylenediamine, and it forms a fluorescent, a fluorescent, and that fluorescent is measured. So in this case, in this particular case, if I want to measure L-ascorbic acid to know how much I have L-ascorbic acid versus L-dehydroascorbic acid in my original sample because this is measuring the total because you oxidize everything into aldehyde or ascorbic acid. So I'm measuring all of the amount of vitamin C. But if I wanna know if how much I had L-ascorbic and how much I had aldehyde or ascorbic acid, what do I do in this case? Yeah. 
What do I do to the sample before I measure? To differentiate. So the answer is here, right? I'm oxidizing to L-dehydroascorbic acid. So I run it with oxidation and I run it without oxidation. If I run it without oxidation, I'm measuring only the amount of L-dehydroascorbic acid already in the sample. And then I can run it with oxidation, then I know the total, and the difference will be the amount of L-ascorbic acid in the sample. Okay, so here's my last example is the uh, chemical method for thiamine and riboflavin. Both, the, we, they need to be extracted with autoclaving, so heat, and in the presence of acid, under acidic conditions. So in this case, the thiamine is uh, needed to be uh, broken down or removed, removal of the phosphate esters. In order to remove the phosphate esters, we use enzymatic hydrolysis to break down the ester, so esterases. We remove the phosphate esters and we do some chromatographic cleanup. We oxidize thiamine into thiochrome and the thiochrome fluoresce. We can measure fluorescence. So excitation lambda or absorption lambda is 365 and the fluorescence is longer in wavelength, carries less energy, is 435. For riboflavin, after the extraction, we oxidize interfering material that might fluoresce at the same, um, temp same wavelength, and riboflavin fluoresces on its own. So you measure fluorescence at excitation of 440 nanometer and emission of 565 nanometer. Okay. So that is a short lecture, guys. So I'm done here with the vitamins. I will not start a new uh, lecture for you. That would have been the lab that we would carry out in, like I said, measuring vitamin C in different orange juice samples, but you don't have that lab anymore. Anyway, with that, I'm gonna end here, give you a break since you have taken a quiz and you probably are very tired. I'm less talkative today, less chatty. Uh, so yeah, enjoy the 15 minutes early. I'll see you on Wednesday.